Hello, everyone. Welcome to MaxMean 2024. So the last talk at our conference is by uh, Lucas Popa from the Nomad Laboratory in uh, Berlin. And Lucas will talk from prediction to action. Please, Lucas. Okay, so uh, uh, what I'm going to show in this presentation is like uh, there are two parts. First, I'm going to discuss this uh, type of active learning or sequential learning where we mm -hmm. use the AI model to inform the data acquisition. So we have the machine learning model, but also the data acquisition. Mm -hmm. And then in the second part of the talk, I will discuss a bit some more, uh, more uh, methods that you might have not heard about that are methods that we are developing in the group and we are uh, uh, pushing them uh, forward. And the goal of this method will be to identify material representations and also uh, we, we are interested in methods that can be applied to small data sets especially because of our collaborations uh, with uh, experimentalists where we have a limited uh, accessibility of data okay so uh, one way it was already mentioned several times in this uh, in this meeting that the number of uh, materials that we can imagine is practically infinite so if you think about the periodic table and all of the elements you have there the way they can be combined different crystal structures for instance in inorganic materials uh, you and, and if you think about the, the, the doping effects and all of these uh, things that we can use for materials design, you're going to realize that the number of materials is practically infinite. So one of the way we want to use machine learning uh, in materials discovery is to model the prop uh, the properties that we are interested about. So what we want to do is to have we have a material space where we have a lot of materials, so a very large number, so we can maybe enumerate some type of material space. And we know the labels or the properties that we uh, are uh, interested about, for instance, band gaps or flat bands or uh, something like this, or resi resistivity, uh, resistivity or uh, etc. And we want to train a machine learning model with this small data set with these known labels that you approximate the true function as a function of certain descriptor, which are our features. And I will come back to the descriptor in the presentation. So we want to approximate this function. So uh, if we can do this properly, then we can estimate this property of interest for the, the whole material space, and we can decide uh, which are the new materials that where we have to concentrate our attention, so where we have to study or synthesize and so on. Uh, the way we are doing this, so assessing if a model is useful or not, so that this that there was the question about how useful this, um, this clustering is or this method is. So we normally look at the model performance uh, in terms of uh, um, root mean square error, for instance, or of an average performance. And we often do this with cross validation. So we don't have a lot of data, so we split our data set in different uh, parts and we assess the, the, the performance in uh, a part of the data set that was not seen by the training. This is, I mean, maybe fine to have an idea of the model performance, but the problem that we have in materials discovery is that uh, we have often, uh, we are often interested in statistically exceptional materials that have, for instance, very high values of a certain property. So this means that a good performance in average might not translate to a good description of promising materials because the good performance in average, uh, the average might not be the, the, the thing we're interested about. So how we can handle this, this problem? So uh, realizing these issues, the community of material discovery has uh, been shifting uh, the focus uh, with respect to the mean performance. So, so in, in the case of, uh, as I think the title, from prediction to action. So uh, the idea is that we, we know that the model is not uh, uh, good enough if we only look at the average performance. So we are gonna use an iteratively modeling and data acquisition to identify materials with desired properties. And this uh, one of the examples of such active learning approaches is a machine learning model driven black box optimization, where we want to find materials with a certain uh, optimized value of a property. For instance, we want to find materials that maximize a certain property. So how does this work? We have again uh, a material space where we have like some um, enumerated some materials uh, for which we only know uh, the chemical composition and maybe the structure, but we don't know the property. And then we, we, we have a data set here, we train a machine learning model. And then what we're going to do next in this uh, black box optimization is to define a reward, like borrowing the term from the reinforcement learning. And this reward can, can be, for instance, the maximum value discovered of a certain property in case we want to maximize this. And what we're going to do uh, is to design, a, write a problem in a way that we are going to maximize the cumulative reward. So that the reward that is accumulated uh, over the iterations where we acquire more and more data. So where we acquire the property or the label for some materials in this material space. So how does this work? We, we, 
we run the first time, and then we have an acquisition function, the so-called acquisition function that is going to rank all of these materials in this material space based on the predictions and on the uncertainty of the predictions or the variance of the prediction. And then we're going to augment the data set. So we, we're going to get this uh, uh, label here. We're going to include the data set, and we're going to uh, run this again. And we run uh, many, many times. So that we have, uh, we find materials with better and better performance. For instance, in this case, with a higher value of certain properties. So that's uh, what we are gonna. Uh, that's how a machine learning model-driven black box optimization works. So we use the the machine learning model to inform the data acquisition. So uh, if in this context, we might ask ourselves: so if we cannot trust the mean uh, average performance of the, uh, of the of the machine learning model, what can we use actually to know? Uh, which are the models that perform best in this context. So this is the question we want to address here. So how can we assess the performance of the machine learning model in conjunction with a data acquisition strategy? Because this is going to be also crucial, not only the performance of the model, but also how we acquire new data. So uh, this is the, the example I'm going to discuss uh, in this presentation. So it's an example from computational material science, where we want to discover perovskites with high bulk modules. So perovskites are these type of materials where we have uh, so this uh, very basic uh, formula is a ABO3 type of structure where we have one A cation that is coordinated with 12 uh, neighbors in this uh, habit here. So this is a, a relatively large cation. And then we have smaller B cations inside this octahedra. And here in the corners of this octahedra, we have uh, oxygen uh, uh, anions. So that's the basic structure of the perovskite. Uh, we can also combine and this uh, so this uh, octahedra they can fill, and we have to can the formation have the formations of that. But in this uh, problem, we are going to fix the structure as a cubic ideal structure. So we all only consider this ideal structure. Um, and why is this like a, a challenging problem? So first, perovskites are using many applications, of, for instance, photovoltaics and so. On. And second, by combining different A and B elements, we can find a lot of different materials and many. Of the, the, the elements in the periodic table, they fit into the perovskite structure. So, for instance, we can combine two types of B elements and we form already this structure where we have a mix of B1 and B2. And here you can imagine like that we can also mix two different A's or, uh, or even more. So, the, the, the material space that we are accessible with this unique structure is really uh, uh, huge. So, in this case of this uh, data set, we have 800 materials that for which we know the bulk modules. And, I, and I, I want to mention also that bulk modulus uh, is a measure of the compress resistance toward compressibility of the material. So actually, we look at the energy of the materials as a function of different volumes. So we have the equilibrium volume, and we make uh, we calculate the energy for a slightly higher and lower volume. So we take the second derivative of this energy versus volume curve, and this is what we get as a bulk module. So we can think about this as a proxy for the uh, uh, compressibility resistance toward compressibility of the material. For instance, so for hard materials. Here, our candidate space of materials is uh, have like these thirty thousand materials, so that are like a single and double perovskite. And here, as a descriptor, as a, as a features to model this uh, property, we're going to use twenty four elemental properties of these A and B elements. So we look at very simple properties of three atoms of the A and B elements. And these are, for instance, the radii of certain orbitals of these uh, uh, atoms. Uh, the electron affinity of the uh, of these atoms and energy potential and so on. So very simple properties, and this is all done uh, by calculation. So this is a GFT uh, GGA or uh, general uh, uh, generalized gradient approximation uh, for the exchange correlation functional. Uh, it has implemented in this FHI school. Okay, so uh, now like. How do we write this optimization problem? So our reward is going to be the maximum bulk modules uh, value discovered so far. So this is how uh, what we are going to try to maximize in this uh, in this approach. And we are going to use two very uh, widely used machine learning models, which are Gaussian process and random forest. So Gaussian process is very uh, we want to use that here because uh, it provides predictions and uh, uh, sound uncertainty estimates because it's a probabilistic uh, type of machine learning approach. So that's uh, widely used in optimization approach, for instance, Bayesian optimization. Uh, and we also use random forest here, which is a very popular machine learning model, which um, also gives some uh, idea on this uh, uncertainty of the prediction because you have the different decision trees yeah, that you construct uh, for the random forest. So you can look at the variance of these different predictions if you want to get an idea of the, uh, to estimate the uncertainty. 
Uh, here I want to end. Uh, another reason for using random force as compared to GP is the fact that we uh, random force can handle a, a higher dimensional representation. So it doesn't suffer from uh, more, uh, in the case where we don't know the representation, we want to offer a lot of different parameters. So that's uh, what the reason we use this tool. We are going to use two acquisition functions for this uh, 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 to, for this study. So the first one is the pure exploitation, where we simply look at the maximum book modulus uh, prediction and we select that material for data acquisition. And the second one, the uh, acquisition function called respect improvement, which will look uh, both at the uncertainties and the predictions in order to make a choice. And I'm not sure uh, how uh, if you guys are familiar with this. But what uh, expected improvement does is to look at the expected value of the, the, the reward improvement at each iteration. So imagine here that you have like this is a descriptor and this is the model. So we have these data points uh, and this is the mean prediction. And here you cannot really see well, but you can look at your uh, zoom in, in case you're there. Uh, you have some like shaded area here that corresponds oh, yeah. to the variance yeah. of the predictions. Uh, and here, uh, what we are going to do is to look at, uh, we are going to select the points in material in the crypto space that correspond to the highest value of the predicted improvement with respect to the maximum that we observe at a certain iteration of the approach. Yeah, I don't know if I'm this ask if this is not uh, clear, but in this case, we're, look, we're going to be looking at, so if this is the maximum value we have seen so far, we're going to look at this area here, uh, like uh, for, for this point here, for instance. So we have like a distribution of predictions, mm -hmm. and then we are going to look at the extent of improvement that we expect for this um, material here, or this point in this crypto space. Um, well, of course, we have a list of materials, so we have only some points in this crypto space where we have material. Sorry, what is the crypto space? So yes. here we have, uh, for instance, this 24, uh, it's a vector that has 24 components, uh, and these are the properties of the A and B elements that enter into the state composition. Like what property? So the chemical properties, for instance, electron affinity, language potential, and so on. So here we have no structure. It's only compositional mm -hmm. because it fixes structure. Mm -hmm. In general, it can be anything. Okay, and here um, we have like this uh, trade-off between exploration and exploitation. So we are, we want to find to select materials for which we have a high book module predictions, we, but we also want to explore a little bit. And this is uh, this corresponds to points in, in a material space where we have high uncertainty. And in this uh, this uh, 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 probability distribution here are going to be very wide. So this will going to push us to explore new areas of material space. Okay. So uh, yeah, for instance, here this is the expected improvement. So we would take we would like to acquire data in this position here. If we use expected improvement, uh, we take the maximum of this uh, acquisition function. So in total, we have four methods that we are testing here. So we have the two machine learning models with two different acquisition functions. And that's what we are going to uh, be using to run the optimization. OK, so first, before going to the results uh, of the uh, active learning on this uh, uh, black box optimization, I show you here the mean square error in the initial data set. So uh, this is the mean square error as a function of the size of the training data set. So we obtain training data set by sampling with replacement, this 814 material. And this is the size of the, so this is a bootstrap sampling. Uh, so this is the size of the training set and the errors. And here you see that the both approaches, Gaussian process and random forest have a very similar performance. Uh, and the performance improves with data, which, which is what we expect. And these errors here, uh, they, have, they are very low compared to the values that we have uh, you know, both modules in the, in the data set. So the values go from uh, 0.5 to 1.5 uh, uh, electron volt per uh, square uh, per uh, angstrom cube. And this is extremely low. So it shows from these results, you would say that the models are very good. Actually. And they, we don't have a significant difference between the two models. However, when we run the optimization, we see a different story. And here I show you the reward curves of the real experiment. And in this case, our experiment is a DFT calculation where we go and check that material that was suggested. And what I'm showing here is uh, the maximum observed value of the whole module, so the quantity that we want to maximize, uh, as a function of the number of iterations that we run this, uh, this uh, optimization. So initially, the best uh, value we have is this 1.48 uh, electron volt uh, per uh, uh, Einstein cube. And then you see how different methods uh, will find at different iterations materials with higher values than that initial one. 
And here, this uh, the, sh the, 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 the shaded areas here uh, correspond to 10 repetitions starting from slightly different uh, training sets. So that's, that's the result. What we see here is that um, the best method here that you find uh, a material with uh, a both modules uh, equal to 1.75 in this uh, this iteration here is the Gaussian process when it's coupled with the expected improvement of the function. So this shows that uh, for, uh, if we are doing a better job if we combine exploration and exploitation in our optimization. And that's what you see in this, uh, uh, in this uh, orange curve here. Then we can also see that uh, Gaussian process with extract improvement is much better than Gaussian pro pro uh, process with uh, uh, XT, which is the pure exploitation, which didn't find any material here. And this is probably because uh, Gaussian process was trapped in a local maximum and could not escape from that. Uh, so there was a local maximum in the initial data set. And because we have no exploration, uh, we didn't escape from that uh, maximum. Uh, and this year, for comparison, we have the uniform sampling where we are just randomly selecting a material from the candidate space and evaluating the property uh, of uh, interest in our case both modules. Yeah, is this clear? Uh, any questions mm -hmm. in this? Yeah. Well, that's basically like this, uh, like active learning or something. Yes, yeah. So at, we have the maximum value in the data set and then we create the machine learning model for 30,000 of materials and then we select each of uh, each time one material for calculation. For, for evaluation. So we can think that it's of an experiment if you have a high throughput estimation facility or so. So in is third, is there in your like this uh, reward function or is there any like uh, way to penalize you know to calculate more in the DST? So how because that would just why would it not request to calculate like any material? So what the, how this is in EI, how this uh, uh, expected improvement curve? So you, you evaluate for each of these uh, 30,000 materials, the prediction plus the uncertainty. And with that, you can tell uh, how much do you expect. That you want to have the highest uncertainty, basically. Not really. You have a balance of both. You want to have high uncertainty, but also if, if you have a short, like a, um, a low uncertainty, and you're sure that the value of the, uh, the property is high, then it also scores high with respect to the quantity. So I, I am maximizing the sum for average plus for uncertainty. We max actually what this application function is doing is that at every iteration you want to have the highest possible next material. Mm -hmm. So you, whenever you found something in one region of the material space, uh, you go probably to another region of the material space because you don't want to find something that is super close uh, from where you were because you have this uncertainty component. I don't know if it makes sense to you. Yeah. But the idea is here, here you, you don't want to spend uh, your DFT budget to calculate 30,000 materials if you can, in third iterations, already tell uh, which are the ones that are very high. Yeah. And if you only take the predictions, for instance, if you look at this random forest, you might find some things that are very good in the beginning. But with time, you will not find like a, a different material. And if you look at the composition, I'm not showing here which materials are at every time, but if you look at the compositions, you find a lot of more diversity when you use like an expect improvement that is exploring the material space also. Yeah. So that's why it's uh, for maximization, this expect improvement is, is a very good choice in general and also for this application. Yeah. Okay, so these uh, are the results we get. Uh, uh, but then, you know, if I cannot predict by the mean square error, uh, which are the best machine learning model, and that I, how do I, I know which are the how do I know this uh, that GP and EI is the best combination before I run the experiment? Because I want to do this with, without having to acquire all these labels, right? Uh, so the this is what we are going to propose here. Uh, the first thing that you can think of is this what we call naive reward estimator. So we take um, this uh, material space, so we have the unknown label, so the material space, we don't know the property and the known label. Uh, and then from this, uh, we can only use this part here for doing this estimation because we, we need the labels or we need to know the property we like. So one uh, thing that you can think of is to first have a small data set uh, as an initial training data set to run this optimization and then use the remaining data here uh, as a, a pool of candid materials for reward estimation. And then if you do that, you can run the optimization with different uh, methods. So with different machine learning models and acquisition functions, 
using this as a proxy for the real candidate space. However, if you do that, you will see that you don't have like a, a proper ranking. So here, these are estimated reward curves. So this, there is no calculation. So you see the range of, uh, um, of values is different. Uh, uh, and what we see that we don't have the good ranking of the different methods if you use this approach. Uh, and this is because we are using here a much smaller training data set compared to the real one. So we have different performance in that. And also the proportion of uh, materials that are exceptional or that are the ones we are searching for might not be representative of this uh, whole pool of material space. So that are the two problems with this naive uh, estimator. Uh, so we, we uh, were thinking on how to overcome these issues. And here we propose a different type of reward estimation where we are gonna have realistic sizes of training and candidate space. And we're gonna have a, a, a representative amount of rare materials or the materials we are caring about, the high bulk models. So how do we do that? So first we hold out the top Q quantile of this initial brain data set. These are the materials that have this property as, as we want to find. So high bulk models. Then uh, we bootstrap sample. So we sample with replacing from this initial training data set uh, to find the training uh, data set that contains the same size of this one. Uh, and then we have some of these black uh, uh, materials here are the ones that were not sampled during this uh, uh, approach. So we, we combine them with this, um, this uh, whole out top quantile. And then to get a realistic size of this uh, standard material space, we are going to apply perturbations on these unsampled uh, materials to then upsample this to find like uh, uh, to get make sure that the absolute sizes of these uh, rare materials compared to the candidate space is representative of the uh, true material space. That's what we are going to do here. And uh, yeah, so this cube here can uh, so how much we 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 hold out this we can estimate from sampling the material space by using, for instance, a much lower amount of samples compared to the true value of 30,000. So this will save some uh, resources. And now we can use this uh, more like carefully designed uh, 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 proxy problem to understand which are the, the performance of different machine learning models with different data acquisition. And if we do that, we again have this estimated reward curves so for this few here. And here we see that, I mean, the, the estimation is not perfect, but we have some behavior that uh, we can uh, recover from the true experiment. For instance, we see that this Gaussian process to expect improvement is the best method for this specific problem. Uh, and we also see other things like, for instance, that the, the random forest uh, will find very fast good materials, but then we'll uh, be uh, in a plateau there, just like we have in two experiments. And the scale is very different. Okay. The scale is very different because we are only <laughs> using the training set. So the materials in the training set, they don't, the maximum is 1.48. Mm -hmm. So we are not, this doesn't give you like a quantitative um, prediction on how much you will improve on the best materials, but it gives you the ranking of the which machine learning model I have to use with which existing quantity. That's the idea here. Mm -hmm. The valid filters seem to be very close. Uh, I mean, just here we have the different scale, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the the what is important, I think, is the the ranking of the different uh, mm -hmm. of the different methods. It's it's not like we don't recover all of all, all of the behavior there, but this seems that is this approach for creating a very realistic um, uh, test uh, uh, data set where we can run this optimization. Uh, gives like a better result than this naive reward estimation. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. And we are still working on how to estimate these in a appropriate manner because the result might change as a function of the skew. And you also have these perturbations that are done here, and you have different ways of doing that. I didn't understand this. You have this rare materials, right? Mm -hmm. That looks like the most interesting one, right? Yes. Yeah. Why then the border with everything else? Well, why, why, why is like. Um, you can do some like uh, I don't know Pareto front or something. Mm -hmm. Just uh, focus on those which are exceptional, then perturb them and see if anything can be covered. Because it's uh, so so low. Yeah, the, the yes. idea here was that I mean there are definitely different methods to do, to solve this problem, and I will show you my method. Uh, but here uh, the idea is that you want to have a scenario where you will test your uh, machine learning model and application uh, strategy that is realistic. And in reality, and in this problem, we have very few of the materials with high book modules. Mm. 
Uh, and if you just take this initial data set as a proxy for that, you might not get the right answer because the, the proportion of uh, high book module materials in the initial data set might be different from the actual mat true material space. And in your, in this, the, the, the parameter space, uh, the landscape, uh, is it very like, there are also global minima and it's very like, you know. And so we, we uh, is there any way to check? Not really. <laughs> I mean, if we do the labels for all the materials, we, we can do this. But you can look at the, the like synthetic functions, so like analytical functions, and then run this optimization. And then you will see that how this uh, escapes the local minimum. And so, but what I'm saying now, now from this case, is like this is like a, uh, like a true material discovery problem in, in which reflects what we have in general. We, we don't know this landscape. Uh, and that's why we want to have this efficient way of navigating there. But is it a, clo a closed space? I mean, do you... This is a closed space. So you you won't have any, like, materials? Because, I mean, maybe there's an extrapolation. Maybe, the, you know, it only can yeah. interpolate within this. Is there a... Can you go outside of that parameter space? Or? Well, you have the... So here's a compositional model. So we have only the composition that enters the system. And you see that um, you we have new elements in the candidate space that were not in the, the training set. Mm -hmm. In that sense, we, you need to do extrapolation to find the, the good material. Mm -hmm. What that meant is like, for example, if you if you had a, a dopant, you know, an extra atom, mm -hmm. that, that would dramatically change because yeah, then yeah. It, it gets like very big in the, the space, right? Yeah, yeah. And here in this case, if you look at this perovskite, you could have uh, like a, actually any proportion of uh, V1 and V2 here, mm -hmm. or any proportion of A1 and A2 if you have two. So mm -hmm. this actually this space is infinite, mm -hmm. but we are using this specific uh, 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 structure here because we can calculate the CFT. By specific structure, or, 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 a cubical grid, yeah, a cubical mm -hmm. lattice. And if you replace atoms, uh, how about um, edge lengths uh, in this cubical grid? Uh, will they say will, will will they change at least a little bit? So if you if you replace the atom, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So we we have like uh, here we selected I don't know like uh, twenty or thirty mm -hmm. elements for each of these positions, and then we we look at all possible combinations, and for each of them you have a different lattice parameter and different properties. But, but still, but still cubic. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you allow distortions, then the situation gets much more complex. Mm -hmm. But here uh, we are doing this in a fixed kind of um, structures because we want to just uh, focus on the ML model. Uh -huh. Right. So but yeah, you can have like very different structures. Okay. So, Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Good. Uh, last thing I want to say here about this. Is that now we look? I just wanted to show you, like, compare this curve of the mean square error that I showed in the beginning with the error now assessed in these discovered materials that we discovered doing this optimization. So, here, this is the initial data set, and these different uh, so this is the, the both modules and the histogram. Uh, and here, these are the materials that were found by these different methods the Gaussian process with expected improvement, the random forest with expected improvement, and so on. And you see that the distribution of values is much shifted towards uh, high values, which because we are searching for. Um, high performance, uh, high book model materials. And if we look at the performance of this model train in the initial data set, in the, for these discovered materials, we are going to see that the performance is much, uh, and this I'm calling out of distribution, the performance is much worse uh, when we have these materials. So, uh, and this is like a significant difference. So, it means that if we just do like cross validation and get a mean square error based on the initial data set, this doesn't tell you much about how. Uh, good these models are performing for the actual materials we care about, which are the ones that have high book modules. So this shows that this analysis of mean square errors or average errors uh, by cross validation can be misleading for the actual discovery of materials. Yeah, that's, that's what uh, I wanted to show you. Okay, any questions for, for now? So uh, if in the, I have some time more, I guess. Uh, I would like to show, uh, so here, this is like the, the, the paper. So these are the ones to acknowledge the people that uh, did this work, actually. So Matthias Schaeffer um, uh, at, at in Berlin, and then Mario Bolle and his team in the Monash University in Australia, which we collaborate. It's really and here, we uh, this, is, this contribution is part of this review paper that it summarizes a lot of um, aspects in data-centric material science or AI methods, so you can check uh, if you're interested, there are very different things there. But it's kind of summarizes the view of the department on uh, AI. And this is like a 
Okay, uh, now I in the remaining time, I just want to show a different way, one or two, depending on the time, mm -hmm. of solving this problem. And these are using more uh, different types of methods, and especially maybe it's what Arthur uh, just uh, said. Why do we care about all the materials if we just want to put in the hybrid model? So here, uh, the, the challenges we have by using this very widely used machine learning approaches. So we want, always want to find like a description uh, approximation of the material property as a function of some descriptor or some, some parameters. Uh, however, if we want to get some insights from the physics or chemistry that is governing these properties, we would like to have uh, the identification of key features that are correlated properties. So we don't want a lot of parameters here, but we want to offer many parameters and let the algorithm choose which are the, the most important ones. And why do we want to do this? Because sometimes we don't, and we are not even sure about the, the underlying processes that are occurring to detect this property. So both models are simple property, but if you look at catalysis, for instance, there are so many different mechanisms and processes that we will compete that we normally don't know the representation or the, the, the key features. So we want to have a me uh, method that finds these, these key features. And in analogy to genes in biology, we are using the, uh, we are often calling them material genes, these parameters, because they reflect complex relationships without providing the tool of the understanding of the underlying processes. That's uh, the term we are going to use sometimes. Second, we only have, sometimes we have very few observations that correspond to the desired behavior. So normally we know a lot of bad materials. So if you look at some superconductivity and so on, we know a lot of materials that are not superconductors, but we only know very few that are actually explain this behavior. So this leads to unbalanced data. So we know a lot of, so if we want high values here, we know a lot of materials here, but we know very few here. And finally, uh, we have multiple mechanisms that might govern different properties. And if we fit a global model, we might miss some of these details that are important. For instance, here we can imagine that we have a different model here, not the, the one that corresponds to most of the data, or maybe a different model here. Uh, and maybe we would be missing this exceptional material if we do this global model. So I would like to discuss these two methods. Actually, I, I think I will have one time for one, which is subgroup discovery that will address some of these points. Yeah? And I will apply to the same problem. Uh, Okay, so uh, I assume that you never heard about this method because it, like, even in the material science community, this is very, yeah, this comes from the data mining uh, community. And what subgroup discovery will do is to uh, is start here. So, given a data set of a population, so our data set, P uh, of a population P, and a target of interest Y, in our case, the book module, we want to identify description of subsets of data that are statistically more interesting with respect to this target Y. And this target Y can be anything. In our case, it's a material property, but it can be anything. So the way this works, in a few words, is that we start with a data set that has one target and many candidate discrete parameters that might be important or not. So we don't know initially, so we offer a lot of them. And then uh, subgroup discovery will first uh, uh, generate propositions about these parameters that are only verified for part of the data set. For instance, uh, parameter one, to be higher than a certain threshold, uh, or a parameter two should be lower than a certain threshold, this type of uh, propositions in the case of metric uh, uh, parameters. And then uh, if you find uh, conjunctions of these propositions that result in subselection of data that are associated to, uh, that maximize a certain quality function that introduces what we want subgroup to, to be. And this quality function normally has this form here. It's a product between two terms. The first term is the coverage. So here we look at the size of the subgroup. So the number of data points that satisfy these groups uh, with respect to the size of the data set. So by using this term, we, we, find, we want to find like a pattern that is uh, a group pattern, not an individual pattern. And then the second term here is the so-called utility function that we, uh, uh, here is where we introduce our requirement on the property or how, what we consider more uh, statistically interesting. This can be, for instance, the, uh, what I'm going to use here, uh, the Jensen channel divergence between distributions. So what is this? Uh, probably you heard about this, but the, the, this is a measure of the divergence between distributions. And uh, for instance, for two Gaussians that are completely overlapping to each other, this is going to be zero. And then if you shift these distributions, this the value goes up. And if you make the, the standard deviation or the narrowness of this distribution different, you, this quantity will also go up. So in this case, we are favoring uh, sub-selections of the 
data sets that have uh, shifted distributions or narrow distribution compared to the whole data set. That's what this file becomes or you think comes to do. Uh, so if we maximize this, we try to find the descriptions that maximize this, we are gonna end up, for instance, uh, having such type of uh, subgroup. So we, we find a rule that describes something that is as dissimilar as possible compared to the data set with respect to distribution of these targets. Basically outliers. Yes, uh, outliers if you want, but here by using this term here, they will have something in common. So it, it, you're not looking for like one or two data points, but a group of data points. Mm -hmm. And this is what makes it interesting because even if you have one material that is an outlier, you, you want to find a description of like a set of subset of materials. So it's different from outlier detection, but it has some, uh, yeah. Uh, so you're maximizing these two, right? Yeah. And it can be maximized by either increasing the size of subgroup or by increasing the utility function. Yeah. So the utility function will be trivially maximized for one data point. Mm -hmm. But you force a description of more than one data point by having this coverage term. Mm -hmm. So you don't want only one data point, you want a group. Yeah. And you think the product of those two is the is the best one? Uh, so we, yeah, it's a good question. So in this space, I mean, mm -hmm. we are looking at a Pareto front optimization of these mm -hmm. two. Uh, Criteria because they are competing objectives. Mm -hmm. You want to have a lot of data points, but you also want the utility function to be high. And you can look at different trade offs between these two mm -hmm. and decide what is best for your application. Mm -hmm. So you use your product in this one. Yes. Okay, so at the end of the analysis, we we have the well, we have these key parameters because from all of the initially offered ones, this rule will only depend on some of them. So we have some kind of representation learning. Mm -hmm. And then you also have this, uh, uh, the rules that tells what the parameters value should be for the desired behavior. Uh, and here uh, I show again this, so this is the same example as before. So this is the data set from the qualification. These are all the, the, the parameters that we offer. So it's like uh, the radii of some, uh, some orbital electron affinity, electron activity and so on. Uh, and then uh, I jump directly here to the results we have with subgroup discovery. So we find subgroup rules that describe prospects with hybrid models. And so now this description is only focused on the hybrid models. We don't care about the others. Of course, we use the data set to generate rules, but we focus there. So this is the distribution of the, the both models in the training set, in this case, 500 materials. And these are the rules that we identify um, for describing materials with high book models. So the rules say that the radii of the balance orbital of these eight species here should be lower than a certain threshold, or the radii of this element that is inside this octahedra should be higher than that one. The electron affinity of this B should be uh, uh, correspond to a certain threshold, and the, the atomic number of B have to be lower than that one. And here, this is the distribution of book modulus that's of material that satisfy those uh, those rules there. There are 45 materials. So out, out of these 500, we have a description of 45 materials that are associated with very high values of this target. Yeah. You try all signals, all possible signals from that space. Uh, no, this is a, that's a Monte Carlo. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's uh, we use like a stochastic Monte Carlo based algorithm for that. There are different flavors of algorithm we can use. How many of those signals are possible? Uh, it's like infinite, right? I'm not sure about here, but it's it's quite. I mean, you can put constraints on how many of those. So you try to find a sparse solution where they only depend on a certain of this. So here you have four propositions. So you put uh, constraints on the number of propositions you want, or you you accept. And but you see, yeah, it's very it's very large. So there are some ways of doing that. Um, it's the question is just purely random. I mean, it's on random. Yes, yeah. it's uh, we use like opportunistic pruning, for instance. So we we generate uh, uh, propositions that are proportional to the coverage mm -hmm. or the size of the the data uh, set that they select, mm -hmm. and then you you uh, iteratively replace propositions and combine them uh, to form like to maximize that quality function. It's not the best way, but it's a practical one. There are stochastic uh, like more deterministic methods. But they cannot handle so many features. So this is one problem. Second question: How do you do it? Do you use some package or something? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is. I mean, you, you have subgroup discovery implemented in many different ways. So having the market is different. I think we can talk about this. But okay. So then you have the rules. Um, 
So why, how can I use this rule? So now I can apply this rule to the standard space of these 30,000 materials that I integrated. And this is what I did here. So uh, we applied those rules to the standard space. And then uh, we, we calculated with more DFT calculations, uh, 50 of the materials that were selected by the rules. Uh, and here, this is the distribution of uh, both modular files for these 50 materials that we actually verified the both modules. And here, what we see is that uh, the rules are meaningful in the sense that they indicate the materials of high book modules too. And here, uh, you see that the maximum uh, among these materials, the maximum value is 1.67 uh, uh, here. Uh, so it's much higher than what we have uh, in the data set that we used to train the model. So this means that the rules that you obtain, they were able to indicate materials that have even higher performance than what we have used for training the rules. Which is like non trivial for AI. Uh, so we, we are, we trust that this type of approach uh, can lead to, to the discovery of actually really acceptable materials. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think I will stop here. Um, there is, all, uh, do, do I have two minutes? Two minutes, yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> or uh, there's another method that we're going to use here um, actually to bridge the, the, the um, physical model with AI model. That is based on symbolic regression. And maybe I will quickly show this and then we can discuss over lunch a little bit later. So, this is called security independent screening and specifying operator. And the, the idea of symbolic regression approaches is to find mathematical equations describing data. So, here we, we don't want to have like this yeah, neural network where you can not really see what's happening inside or like a random forest that depends on many parameters and it's very complex structure. We want to have a very compact mathematical form for describing the property. And so this is one approach of doing that. Normally people use genetic uh, algorithms to find these uh, equations. You might have heard about AI Feynman and all these uh, type of symbolic regression approaches. Here is different. Uh, we are going to use compressed sensing. So in a few words, what CISO is doing is first, we start from this um, handed distributed parameters or primary features and we combine them using unary and binary operator. So we have features like this and we form more and more complex features. We do this iteratively, so we form many of them. Like then, I'm talking about billions of features. Now I can give you the number. And then we use a technique that comes from signal processing uh, that is used to reconstruct the signal based on sparse uh, set of um, observations. That is called compressed sensing. And here, this uh, technique have, has two uh, steps. So first, we look at the correlation of these uh, expressions with the property of interest. Uh, and then uh, we look at the correlation of the, these features with the residuals with uh, uh, previously identified models. So we find the most correlated feature uh, and then form this model. And then we look at the, the features that correlate with the residual and so on. And we select subspaces of this feature a space that has billions of elements. And then we can perform an L0 minimization uh, on that space to find a very low dimensional uh, representation for the property of interest. And at the end, we have a model like this, where we can we have very few fitted coefficients. And these dy here are the selected analytical expressions that come from this uh, compressed analysis. And they are components of a descriptor. So, and here, uh, when, we, when I'm talking about the large number of candidate descriptors, we have uh, billions. And here at the end, we're going to have very few. So we have selected from billions of expressions, two or three. So the number of physical coefficients is very low. And this gives us some, uh, we are, by doing that, we are preventing overfitting and we are finding also a very smart solution that depends only on key features out of many offered one initially. So similar to several of oh, so what's the dimension of the... Here? Yeah. So we have like a few. So this in typical is like two, three, five. So we normally start with like something around 20 or 30. And yeah, we can go higher, but then it becomes a bit problematic. We form billions of these expressions. And then in the final model, we're going to have two or three, or and that's the type of order of magnitude we have typically. And here, uh, we apply this to this uh, both models case again. And we actually look at literature to find uh, empirical models or physics based models, if you like, for these properties that were suggested and we reported before for these cubic cross guys. For instance, this one. Uh, and we can use with CISO using a log transformation. So that model was a linear model, but we can just apply logarithm and then get this type of power law model. 
where we have uh, an expression that is derived by sym a symbolic regression that recovers some of the physics, if you like, or the aspects of the empirical model. So that depends here on the lattice constant of the, of the, of the material. And we have other ingredients there. And we can look at this expression and try to. Well, this Komogora is a pan network, right? It, Sorry? It's similar to this pan, you know, the Komogora pan of the network, right? Yeah, I'm not sure what is it doing. Yeah, uh, but Tegeman, uh, I mean, it's a very recent one. They use this auto like functions, like uh, uh, instead of nodes, they use functions inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be. I mean, I'm, I'm maybe I'm, I yeah, I'll show you later. yeah, so this is like here. It just uh, what I want to show you is that we can find compact models that can be comparable to what, uh, yeah, you can uh, use a physical model, a physical based model with a data driven model. So that's the hope that symbolic regression will bridge these two things. Uh, yeah, and finally, I just want to, I don't need to repeat that, but I just want to say that, uh, it's in our vision, it's we have to develop methods that uh, keep where we, while we are keeping in mind that we are searching for exceptions, and this is challenging to do this with AI. But I think we have some tools to, to go uh, to go there, like active learning or subgroup discovery or CISO. Uh, and uh, we hope that we are, we are contributing to material discovery, either in an experimental setting or a computational material setting. Thanks a lot for your attention, and we have to take questions. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Lucas. <laughs> Okay, so I'll stop recording. There were some questions already, so thanks.